We now invite the Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School and his two panelists, Ambassadors at Large, Mr. Bilahari Kausikan, and the inimitable Professor Chan Hing Chi to come up. A round of applause, please. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. We'll give you a few minutes to settle down. I, I told my colleagues that I have, I have great difficulty uh, introducing our two speakers today because each is more brilliant than the other. This is a test to see whether you're still paying attention or not. <laughs> anyway, to, to give you a further test of your attention, uh, I'm going to read out to you, fortunately for me, uh, Mr. Bilahari Kausikan wrote out his own bio data for us to publish in the program. But we're not very courageous. We didn't dare to print this in this program. But this is his self-description. And this is a test to see how awake you are at lunch, after lunch. It reads as follows. Mr. Bilahari Kausikan has lurked about in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the last 34 years in a variety of appointments in Singapore and abroad. Due to catastrophic lapses of attention by the system, he was appointed the second permanent secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. From August 2001 to August 2010, and permanent secretary from September 2010. He retired in June 2013 to huge sighs of relief from the rest of the civil service. <laughs> He's currently ambassador at large and still trying to understand what that means. <laughs> Miraculously, as far as is known, he has done no permanent damage to Singapore's foreign policy. Unquote. <laughs> so that's Mr. Bilahari Kausikang. <laughs> I didn't write this, he did. <laughs> Now, Heng Chi is also a very good friend. I, I, I'll be a bit kinder to her <laughs> and say that three points about her. She's had an outstanding uh, academic career. As you know, she was a professor in NUS, wrote many books, the biography of David Marshall, David Marshall the, the book on the PAP, which is one of the classic books on the PAP. And now, of course, she's come back to academia as head of the Lee Kuan Yew Center for Innovative Cities at SUTD. She's also had an outstanding diplomatic career. She, in fact, succeeded me as ambassador to the UN in 89, then went on to serve for 16 years. That's about how long President Arden courted his wife, by the way. <laughs> she spent 16 years in Washington, D.C. as the uh, Singapore's ambassador there. And she's also had an outstanding career in the NGO world. She was the founder director of the Institute of Policy Studies, which, as you know, is now part of the uh, Lee Kuan Yew School. And of course, and the latest appointment, which is, of course, a major one, which gives lots of hope to all the artists in Singapore. She's now the chairman of the National Artists Council. So with that, now let me, I understand that Bilahari is going to go first. And each of them will try to speak for about 15 minutes. That will be running a bit late, as usual. But hopefully we will have more Q&A. I want to mention, by the way, that the whole conference is now being fed also to the, some of the students at the Lee Kuan Yew School. We may even get questions from them later, and I'll try to bring them into the discussion too. With that, Bilahari, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Kishore. Prof Jayakumar, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honour to be invited to speak on this very significant occasion. And I must thank Kishore for that. But I must also say there's something a little incongruous about tagging a conference the big ideas of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. The term big ideas generally connotes some overarching framework or overarching theory. Yet Mr. Lee once told a journalist, and I quote, I am not great on philosophy and theories. I am interested in them, but my life is not guided by philosophy or theories. I get things done, end of quote. And this is particularly so with regard to his approach to geopolitics or foreign policy, an area to which more than a fair share of nonsense has been attached under the guise of theory. 
it's perhaps more appropriate to talk about Mr. Lee's approach towards international relations and geopolitics. An international relations theorist, an academic international relations theorist, would no doubt call Mr. Lee a realist. And so he is. But no simplistic label can do justice to the eclectic complexity of his approach towards international relations and geopolitics. And I suspect if anyone were foolhardy enough to ask Mr. Lee which of the main schools of international relations, realism, institutionalism, liberalism, constructivism, most influence him, his reply, if he were in a good mood, and if he had even heard of these theories, would be all of the above and none of the above. Mr. B, Mr. Lee is above all, as uh, Minister Heng said at lunch, he is above all an empiricist. He saw the world for what it is and never mistook his hopes or fears for reality. Mr. Lee is not devoid of idealism. After all, he risked his life in the struggle against the Communist United Front for ideals. Still, he knew that in world affairs, as in all fields of human endeavor, not all desirable values are compatible or can be simultaneously realized. Mr. Lee, for example, would not disagree with the proposition that a world governed by international law and international organizations would be preferable for small countries like Singapore. But he would almost certainly question whether a world of sovereign states of vastly disparate power could really ever be such a world. He understood that international order is the prerequisite for international law and organization. So while you may work towards an ideal and must, and must stand firm on basic principles, you settle for what is practical at any point of time rather than embark on chaotic quests. Mr. Lee's big idea was Singapore. On that, he always thought big. Singapore as we know it today would not otherwise exist. And insofar as any central organizing principle infused his geopolitical thinking, it is a laser-like focus on Singapore's national interests. He saw the world canvas whole, but unlike too many self-styled statesmen, Mr. Nee never succumbed to the temptation of capering about on the international stage for his own sake. When he expressed an opinion, it was always to some purpose, even though the purpose may not always have been immediately apparent to everyone. He looked on the world strategically with a broad and long-term vision, and as he said somewhere in a citation I cannot trace, he plays chess, not draft. His geopolitical thought is based on an unsentimental view of human nature and power, a view shaped by experience, particularly as he has on several occasions said his experience of the Japanese occupation. His analyses are characterized by the hard-headed precision with which he zeroed in on the core of any situation undistracted by the peripheral. He expressed his ideas directly without cant of any kind. And this is much harder to do than you may think, and consequently, rare. Fluffy thought and weaselly expression are more usual in diplomacy and the analysis of international relations. For the proof of the scarcity of clear thinking on international issues, just peruse the op-ed and international news pages of any major newspaper with an objective eye. And consider, for example, the many knots Western commentators and, and Western policymakers have tied themselves into over Iraq, Afghanistan, Egypt, and now over Syria. Wishful, ideologically driven thinking, loose talk, and the advocacy of impossible or incompatible goals is far more normal. The disciplined clarity of Mr. Lee's thought and expression was one of the primary sources of his influence that he wielded disproportionate for the leader of a small country like Singapore. His views were valued because they were unvarnished and gave a fresh and unique perspective. He said things that leaders of much larger and more powerful countries may well have thought, it may have liked to say, but for one reason or another could not themselves prudently say. And so he made Singapore relevant.
his support for the Vietnam War at a time when it was popularly, uh, politically unpopular, a war that he believed was unwinnable but nevertheless vital to buy time for non-communist Southeast Asia to put its house in order, is a case in point. Another is his support for the US presence in East Asia long before it became fashionable in our neighborhood. As Mr. Heng said at lunch, Mr. Lee memorably said that he was interested in being correct rather than politically correct. Naturally, he was not always correct. International developments are intrinsically unpredictable and nobody can ever always be correct. But he was more often than not on target and when he was not, he was never too proud to change his position. So when he spoke, even great powers listened. They may not always have liked what they heard, but they listened and more importantly, sometimes acted on what they heard. In his memoirs, Mr. Lee has recounted his 1978 meeting with Deng Xiaoping and how he got him to drop Chinese support for the communist insurgencies in Southeast Asia. That's a familiar story. So let me tell you a less well-known story. In 1981, at the International Conference on what was then called Kampuchea, now called Cambodia, held at the United Nations, the United States was poised to sell out Singapore's and ASEAN's interests in favour of Chinese interests to see a return of the Khmer Rouge regime. The then Assistant Secretary of State in charge of China policy even threatened our Foreign Minister that there would be, and I quote, blood on the floor if we did not relent. We held firm. The next year, Mr. Lee travelled to Washington, D.C. and in a meeting with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, described America's China policy as amateurish. Washington, D.C. being the leaky place as it is, word rapidly spread. As the young desk officer who took notes for that meeting, I was bemused by the spectacle of the Assistant Secretary frantically scrambling to find out what exactly Mr. Lee had said. Now, I don't know if it was coincidental, but the very next year, the Assistant Secretary in question was appointed Ambassador to Indonesia, an important position, but one in which he no longer held sway over China policy. And when his new appointment was announced, the gentleman anxiously inquired through an intermediary if Mr. Lee had told then President Sohato anything about him. <laughs> he was reassured and served honorably in Indonesia. Now, I do not recount this incident in US-Singapore relations merely for the trite and possibly redundant purpose of illustrating Mr. Lee's influence. The real moral of the story is his approach to diplomacy an approach which he hammered into the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and I used the verb uh, literally, but which is not sufficiently understood by the general public or even some sections of our establishment. And it is this. Diplomacy is not about being nice, polite, or agreeable. It is more fundamentally about protecting and promoting the country's interests, preferably by being nice, but if necessary, by other appropriate means. In 1968, Mr. Lee turned down a direct appeal by former President Suharto to pardon two Indonesian Marines who had been sentenced to death for planting a bomb during Konfrontasi that killed several Singaporeans. He could not have done otherwise without conceding that the small must always defer to the big and irretrievably compromising our sovereignty. A Jakarta mob then sacked our embassy and threatened to kill our ambassador. But a few years later, in 1973, he did not shy away from placing flowers on the graves of the two Marines. Now both actions, standing firm on fundamental principle even at the risk of conflict, and making a gracious gesture once the principle had been established, were equally important in setting the foundations of the relationship we today enjoy with Indonesia. Mr. Lee once told an Israeli general who helped start the SAF that Singapore had learned two things from Israel, how to be strong and how not to use our strength. 
meaning that it was necessary to get along with neighbours and that no country can live in perpetual conflict with its neighbours. But Mr Lee had no illusions about the challenges facing a Chinese-majority Singapore permanently situated in a Southeast Asia in which the Chinese are typically a less than fully welcome minority. His greatest mistake was perhaps during the period when Singapore was part of Malaysia to underestimate the lengths to which the Malaysian leadership would go to defend Malay dominance and privileges and this led to what was politely termed the separation. But it turned out well for us, better in all probability than if we had remained in Malaysia. At any rate, it was not a mistake that he would ever make again. The basic issue in Singapore's relations with our neighbours is existential. It is the implicit challenge a successful Chinese majority Singapore, organised on the basis of multiracial meritocracy, by its very existence poses to contiguous systems organised on different and irreconcilable principles. This is sometimes dismissed as historical baggage that will fade with time. But it is really about the dynamic between two different types of political systems which once shared a common history but have since evolved in very different directions. And it is not so easy to envisage the fundamental political differences ever fading away even if time blunts their sharpest edges. Still, when, even when differences were at their keenest, it did not prevent Mr. Lee from working with Malaysia and Indonesia based on the pragmatic pursuit of common interests. It's no secret that the relationship between Mr. Lee and Dr. Mahathir, the former Malaysian Prime Minister, was often testy and fraught with history. But less well known is the fact that until the 2010 Agreement on Railway Land, the most significant Singapore-Malaysia agreement since our independence was the 1990 Water Agreement concluded between Dr Mahathir and Mr Lee, then still Prime Minister. Among other things, it provided for the construction of Lingui Dam. The, the sheer incongruity of Singapore in Southeast Asia is the central geopolitical reality from which flowed the constants in Mr Lee's approach towards geopolitics and key decisions. These include, among other things, the early investment in ASEAN as a stabilizing mechanism at a time when it was still uncertain whether ASEAN would survive. It, his emphasis on the balance of power and the importance of involving all Malaysian, all major powers in regional affairs rather than acquiesce in regional solutions to regional problems. The necessity of anchoring the US presence in Southeast Asia including the offer of the use of our facilities after U.S. forces were no longer welcome in Subic Bay and Clark Air Base in the Philippines. The decision to look forwards in relations with Japan and to forgive, if not forget, despite his own bitter experiences during the Japanese occupation. It includes never giving up on India despite his continuing skepticism about its governance. A non-ideological approach to working with the former Soviet Union whenever possible, despite his anti-communism. And the decision to be the last Southeast Asian country to establish formal diplom diplomatic relations with China, despite his early recognition of the inevitable growth of China's influence and the close personal relationship he enjoyed with many Chinese leaders. Now, no leader, however personally brilliant as an individual, can be internationally influential if he only leads a barren rock. Mr. Lee was influential because Singapore is successful. The core operating principles that Mr. Lee established still form the basis of our foreign policy, although, of course, their application is continually adjusted to changing circumstances. This should not be surprising since we cannot choose our geopolitical situation and small countries have limited options. But the question inevitably arises, can we continue to be internationally effective and relevant in a post Lee Kuan Yew era? It's not a new question. Many years ago, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs commissioned a study, I believe Kishore was the PERMSEC then. Well, many years ago, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs commissioned a study on how Singapore
to continue to have a close relationship with China after Mr. Lee's network of personal contacts with Chinese leaders was no longer available. Uh, before I tell you the conclusion of the, set of the study, I must emphasize that the study was not, not in any way conducted by any Foreign Service officer because the, after lengthy consideration, the conclusion was, have more Lee Kuan Yews. <laughs> now, this was not exactly very helpful. <laughs> but I am not entirely pessimistic. Mr. Lee relinquished executive authority more than 20 years ago. We have, in effect, already been in a post Lee Kuan Yew era for quite some time. There will never be another Lee Kuan Yew. But we are still and can remain internationally relevant so long as Singapore is successful and we do not lose the habits of mind, supple, pragmatic, disciplined and unsentimental long-term thinking focused on the national interests. If we do not lose the core principles and the clarity of expression that Mr. Lee instilled in what is today a far more institutionalized foreign policy system. So long as we retain this edge, our views will continue to be sought by countries large and small Many of them, many of whom seek to emulate our policies. It is, however, not to be taken for granted that we can, in fact, retain this edge. Domestic politics in Singapore is becoming more complicated. Foreign policy will sooner or later be the subject of domestic debates. This is not necessarily a bad thing, provided, and this is a crucial condition, provided foreign policy debates occur within nationally agreed parameters of what is and is not possible or desirable for a small country. This is difficult under the best of circumstances and even more difficult for a country with only a very short shared history. Already and all too often, I see the irrelevant or the impossible being held up as worthy of emulation. I see our vulnerabilities being dismissed or downplayed and I see only a superficial understanding of how the world really works in civil society and other groups who aspire to prescribe alternate foreign policies. And most dangerously of all, I see the first signs, as yet still faint but alas unmistakable, of failure by some to resist the temptation to use foreign policy as a tool of partisan politics. Whatever the dissatisfaction with the government, however great the desire for change, Singaporeans should not lose sight of the old adage, somewhat cliched but not invalid. Domestic politics should stop at water's edge. Even the biggest and most powerful of countries disregards this to their cost and chagrin. For small countries, this regard could prove fatal. Fortunately, the situation is not yet irreversible. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Bilahari. We gave you the most difficult slot after lunch, and I can see that everybody was waking up rather than falling asleep <laughs> as you were speaking. So, Heng Chi, keep it up. <laughs> Mr. Professor Jayakumar, Mr. J.Y.M. Pillay, ladies and gentlemen, in this session, I will try to outline Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's distinct thoughts on foreign policy and how they evolved. I will discuss the Singapore relationship with the United States and how Mr. Lee came to view and value the United States and his role in the US-China relationship. In our first parliament of Singapore, Prime Minister Lee laid out a foreign policy for Singapore. This was November 9, 1965. Whether they are big ideas or not, I leave it to history. But they have become the enduring and basic principles of Singapore's foreign policy. On the broad continuum of foreign policy, countries and leaders work with strategic perspectives, and there are tactical ideas. Some have a poor grasp of strategy and may be caught up with just tactical moves. In the case of Singapore, we are fortunate to have a generation of political leaders and Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, whose strategic understanding of the world is unparalleled. 
I believe Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's most important contribution to Singapore is to have thought through and implemented a strategy of small state survival. Our leaders viscerally felt the vulnerabilities that Singapore faced. In 1965, there could not have been many countries, much less a city-state, that came on the stage to declare, we are an independent country. In the United Nations today, 105 members, or more than half of the 193 member states, are small states, defined as a country with less than 10 million people. We have honed the strategy so finely that many small states approach us to ask how we did it. When I was ambassador in Washington, many small countries in the Caribbean, Africa, and Europe at the end of the Cold War came to find out the key to our success. And the ambassador of Macedonia was directed by an undersecretary in the Clinton cabinet administration to ask me how Singapore succeeded in attracting so much foreign investment. Now, in preparing this paper, I read the relevant uh, sources, 1965 and recent speeches. And what is remarkable, I find, is Mr. Lee's consistency in his ideas. Now, what are his ideas on small state diplomacy that have become the hallmark of Singapore's foreign policy? The most striking fact, rereading Lee Kuan Yew in 2013, is how he saw the inextricable link between domestic policy and foreign policy for our survival as a nation. In the first parliament, Prime Minister Lee could not emphasize enough that his government wanted to establish Singapore as a multiracial, multilingual, multicultural society and nation. This has been alluded to throughout these sessions. This was to differentiate Singapore from Malaysia and the two years of experience where race and racial hegemony was the theme. But Prime Minister Lee pointed to the external relevance of this internal principle. He said the multiracial philosophy, oh sorry, he saw the multiracial philosophy as a protective shield. We have a vested interest, he said, in multiracialism and a secular state. For the antithesis of multiracialism and the antithesis of secularism holds perils of enormous magnitude, not just for the people living in Southeast Asia, but dangers of involvement by bigger powers who see in such a conflict fertile ground for exploitation of either ideological and power interests. I believe he was thinking then of Sokano's Indonesia, the People's Republic of China, and even Malaysia, because this was just after independence. Lee Kuan Yew was clear-headed about the sort of policy Singapore must adopt. In 1966, he advocated, one, a foreign policy of Singapore must be one that encourages major powers in the world to, if not help us, at least not harm us. Two, we must all, always offer the rest of the world a continuing interest in the type of society we project. And three, because power decides what happens, it behoves us to always have overwhelming power on our side. And in that respect, we should seek a maximum number of friends with a maximum capacity to uphold what we and our friends decide to uphold. He was firm that we should have no aspirations or ambitions to exercise authority beyond persuasive moral authority. Don't get too big for your boots, in other words. He continued, we must endeavor to ensure first the political climate in which the force that can be lent to us can be exercised. This means we must always help create that climate of opinion that is supportive of the presence of external powers in the region. At the age of 86, he spoke on this again at the S. Rajaratnam lecture in 2009, and these same ideas come out. Small countries have little power to alter the region. A small country must seek the maximum number of friends while maintaining the freedom 
to be itself as a sovereign and independent nation. Friendship and international relations. It is not a function of goodwill or personal affection. We must always make ourselves relevant so that other countries have an interest in us. That comes up again and again. Now, Singapore con continued through the subsequent decades to demonstrate that to the world that we are relevant, a society they, that they would have an interest in. And apart from our geostrategic location, backed by our strategic views, we have projected ourselves as a hub, a global city, a pace setter, an innovator, and ultimately, as I have often been told in Washington, quote unquote, the country that gets things right. Probably no other country has relied as much as Singapore on domestic achievements, nor needed it as much to achieve its place in the world. Considering its size, stand, our standing is not bad in the pecking order. We do not have the land mass or population that immediately invokes heft and respect. We relied, as Mr. Lee suggested, on becoming that useful country, the country in the region that works, that shining red dot, as a strategy of survival. We make ourselves relevant to others so that it is in their interest to have Singapore around. So the domestic and the international are intertwined. Now, in the early years of our survival, our success was not preordained. Our survival was not preordained. And the vulnerabilities were felt. Mr. Lee saw the regional waters as rough, with big fish eating small fish. Sounds familiar to many of you. He spoke of the small fish caught between the medium fish and the big fish. And our defense strategy would be to turn ourselves into a poisonous shrimp, killing whoever tried to swallow us. But one essential principle Mr. Lee impressed on the region and the world, and which Bilahari has emphasized, is that Singapore, though small country, cannot be pressured by big powers. So we stuck to the decision to execute the two Indonesian Marines. And we also demonstrated we could stand up to US pressure because we continued to cane Michael Fay. Now, overcoming size and ensuring size will not become our destiny is perhaps one of the most important ideas that Mr. Lee implanted in Singaporeans. Now, this idea was shared by his political colleagues, and Mr. Rajaratnam promoted the idea of Singapore as a global city. Mr. Lee enlarged the inter international space for Singapore by developing good bilateral relationships with the major powers and strong trade ties globally. And it was he who suggested we negotiate FTAs to further expand our international economic space. Our leaders chose to identify with the non-aligned movement, a necessary position not to be drawn in the Cold War or into any camp. And multilateralism is essential for small states. So we fully support the United Nations and we fully support ASEAN. Today, the Cold War is over, but the non-aligned movement lives on. And there are the moderates and we are one. And our job is to bridge the gap between the anti-West countries that still persist and the more moderate world. Let me now talk about the, um, the Singapore and the United States. The theme that recurred frequently in the early days of Mr. Lee's thinking was that quote, small countries need a big friend, unquote. And we must always have overwhelming power on our side. In 1965, our security needs post-independence were immediately met by the continuation of the Five Power Defense Pact. But it was clear Britain was withdrawing from the region. It was a question of when. Lee Kuan Yew himself wrote that he viewed the Americans with mixed feelings. That the United, but the United States was the only country, only power that could push back communism. He did not know the Americans. He had studied in Cambridge. He knew the British, their culture, their thinking, and he had dealt with 
British officials. So Mr. Lee, Prime Minister Lee, began working with the Johnson administration. In 1968, between October and December, he took a short sabbatical to Harvard to get to know America and Americans better. Mr. Lee considers this time a very useful surgeon. Of all the people he met, he made a lifelong friend in Henry Kissinger. Dr. Kissinger is fond of telling his Lee Kuan Yew story to an American audience. PM Lee had come to Harvard at the height of the anti-Vietnam protests. At a dinner table in Harvard, surrounded by many anti-war academics, the professors complained and riled against the US government and Vietnam policy, arguing for a hasty pullout and the end of the war. They thought the leader from Asia would be a kindred spirit. According to Kissinger, Prime Minister Lee looked around him took things in for a few seconds and said, you make me sick. He then went into a long exposition of why the United States should stay the course in Vietnam. As you know, decades after the war, Mr. Lee told the world that the US presence in Vietnam bought non-communist Southeast Asia time so that we could build our political institutions and develop our economies. So began his and Singapore's long friendship and relationship with the United States. To understand this, we must remember Mr. Lee Kuan Yew is a committed non-communist. He fought a long struggle riding the communist tiger. In the 50s and 60s, there were two great political struggles facing Singapore. One was anti-colonialism, the other was a struggle for the political identity of Singapore, communist, or non-communist. Now, the United States was in Vietnam. The US-Japan Mutual Defense Treaty was seen as a stabilizer for security and prosperity in the region. But for Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, the, role, the US role in Asia was not just a military one. The US offered markets, technology, and investments to the region that no other power could match. This was essential for the emergence of the four Asian tigers and the ASEAN countries. Then soon, there was another new wind. In 1987, Lee Kuan Yew gave a keynote address at a Chogam meeting in Canada. It was an interesting time. Mikhail Gorbachev had become the new president of the Soviet Union. He launched a program of glasnost, perestroika, and democratization. Prime Minister Lee noted the Soviet Union seemed to have lost its ideological fervor of promoting revolution, focusing instead on restructuring the economy. In China, Deng Xiaoping had embarked on modernization of its economy. At the same time, the US economy was in recession and debt was growing. Prime Minister Lee spoke about the relative decline of American dominance. 1987. He pointed out that the US and the Europeans were Christian nations. They have a missionary tradition of going out to save heathens, and they've been spending their surpluses to invest on developing countries. The surpluses were now with J Japan. He wa was not so sure what Japan would be like. They were Shinto Buddhists and did not proselytize. He said he was comfortable with the U.S. hegemon. He was not so sure with the Japanese hegemon. But Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, like everyone else, did not anticipate the end of the Soviet Union and that the world so quickly and that the world order would so fundamentally change. At the end of the the end of the Cold War saw America as the world's hegemon, more powerful than ever before, more confident than ever before, and triumphalist. During the Clinton administration, America's growth was unparalleled in 30 years, its political position unassailable, and Madeleine Albright called her country the indispensable nation. Europe was mired in its expansion of the EU and its problems. Then China's emergence into the international system as the new rising power and the growing power of the BRICS 
forced strategic thinkers to come to grips with the implications. U.S. debt and deficit issues undermine the U.S. ambition to remain the world's only superpower for the rest of the century. And this was further challenged by the financial crisis of 2008 and 9. In 2012, China emerged as the number two economy in the world, pushing Japan to the third place. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, in his book, One Man's View of the World, his latest book, in fact said, America will over time find it even harder to assist, assert its influence. It will not be business as usual. That is a shifting of power. In this battle of preeminence, he sees Asian nations, lesser powers, will have to adapt accordingly. But he admits he feels some, quote, sense of regret at the shifting of power balance because I see America as a benign power, unquote. Now, what is striking is the role that Lee Kuan Yew has carved for himself. Right from the beginning, he spoke as a politician of conviction. He's prepared to go against the dominant view and speaks quite candidly about what is good for the region and what is good for Singapore. To him, the US is a Pacific power and has a definite role in the Asian region. And that the US-China relationship is the most important relationship in the, this century. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew has made many efforts to help the West understand China. Equally, he has sought to explain the United States in all its contradictions to the Chinese. He does not want the two to get into conflict. He fears they will misunderstand each other, underestimate each other, and miscalculate. His main concern is to ensure a stable US-China relationship, which is a sine qua non for a peaceful and prosperous Asia. He sees his role as balancing the two powers to keep them on an even keel. Mr. Lee was sometimes speaking up for one side, at other times for the other. And Singapore's foreign policy is best served by ensuring views going in the wrong direction do not go unchecked. And he sees his role, Singapore's role, as the moderator. In fact, Mike Green, a senior director of Asian Affairs in the Bush White House, once described Singapore's role as a pilot for the United States, guiding the superpower or supertanker into the harbour. Singapore would tell the US, come in, come in, or at times, go back, go back, because the US may be overstepping. Now, during the Vietnam War in the late 60s and 70s, when voices crescendoed calling the US to bring back the troops home and to end the war, Lee Kuan Yew argued for the US to stay. Post-Vietnam, when America could not forget Southeast Asia fast enough and the region grew hostile to the US military presence, Lee Kuan Yew spoke of the dangers of a US withdrawal from the region. But with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the United States and Europe believed in the end of history. They believed that they should now pursue the agenda of promoting democracy and human rights as universal values. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew took on the West in a debate on values. Perhaps he saw this as a new cultural imperialism. It was in this context that the case of Michael Fay, the bad boy who vandalized more than 20 cars one evening in 1993, became the cause célèbre and caused the biggest row in US-Singapore relations. After President Clinton's appeal, we reduced the sentence of six strokes of the cane to four. This was not a high point in our bilateral relationship. But when the US economy began its descent into spiraling deficits and debt, and the collapse of the financial institutions in 2009 were clear, Mr. Lee felt compelled to speak out against the declinist school because he did not subscribe to it. He remains convinced the US economy is resilient and has a wealth of creative talent and will continue to do well.
Now, in the same way he has spoken up for China, in the 1980s and 1990s, the West dismissed China's growth and its sustainability, some even arguing China faced fragmentation. Li Kuan Yu told Americans and Europeans that China's growth was real and it would be the biggest thing that ever happened in history. He repeatedly told the West that they could not stop China's growth and even if it should stumble for a couple of years, its trajectory was upwards in the long term. He, continued, he con cautioned the United States against underestimating China. Today is the other way around. He has been talking up America much more, explaining why the US will enjoy long-term success and remain competitive. He's also concerned that China will underestimate the United States. But a discussion of Mr. Lee's contributions to foreign policy would be incomplete without highlighting his ability to forge relationships with the leaders of the world. He put great store in personal relationships. These relationships bought Singapore pace, space. It was not just a question of bonhomie and sociability, though I've seen Mr. Lee charm his hosts in America. They seek his company for his strategic insights, his understanding of the region, and his take on the world. He has a way with words. He puts things succinctly and with the right nuance. He got on very well with Republican presidents Nixon, Reagan, and Bush 41. He is close to Henry Kissinger, George Shultz, Brent Scrollcroft. They are of his generation, and they share the same strategic perspectives. He met President Clinton in year 2000. I was then in Washington. Because of the Michael Fay episode, our access to the White House for a while was not the same not as good as previously. Then senior minister, then he was senior minister. He, senior minister Lee was told he would have a meeting with NSC advisor Sandy Berger and President Clinton would do a drop by for about 15 to 20 minutes. This was year 2000. Senior minister had a conversation with Berger first. Then President Clinton strolled in Coke can in hand, and he sat on the sofa opposite Mr. Lee. The room was small, but good for conversation. The back and forth went on, and the meeting lasted 45 minutes. I was told after the meeting that President Clinton was so impressed by Mr. Lee that he turned to his officials and demanded, why have I not met this man before? Later, Bill Clinton came to Singapore a couple of times after he stepped down from his presidency on his lecture rounds, and he met with Mr. Lee Kuan Yew again and again. He invited Mr. Lee to the Clinton Global Initiative a few times. Finally, Mr. Lee made an effort to attend the CGI in Hong Kong, which was scheduled on 1st to 3rd December 2008. This was shortly after his heart surgery on November 29 to implant a cardiac pacemaker. He made an effort to show up against his doctor's orders because he had given his word. I am told as he spoke, the wound on his arm where the drip had been started to bleed, but he kept on speaking and he bled and you could see it on his jacket. That is the kind of commitment Mr. Lee shows and that is his word. Mr. Lee also had good relationships with major captains of industry, the chairman and CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. They trusted him, so they believed in Singapore. Now, Mr. Lee has been called by many honorifics for his achievements. During my term as ambassador in Washington over 16 years, I saw Mr. Lee receive four major honors. The term Asian statesman is frequently used. His own view of himself is quite modest. When asked how he wished to be remembered, Mr. Lee characteristically replied, I don't want to be remembered as a statesman. First of all, I do not classify myself as a statesman. 
I put myself down as determined, consistent, and persistent. I set out to do something. I keep on chasing it until it succeeds. That is all. Anybody who thinks he is a statesman ought to see a psychiatrist. <laughs> now, statesman or not, I believe his ideas, his speeches, and policies on foreign policy were read, will be read and reread especially from the perspective of a small state survival. And if Singaporeans, young Singaporeans, the next generation, choose to read and to understand what he is really saying and why it is good for Singapore, I think our future will be bright. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you, Heng Chi. I think we need two microphones up here. Uh, they're coming, and you can see that we made the right decision, the uh, right decision to have uh, very light food for your stomach and very heavy food for thought after lunch. <laughs> I think that was the right balance. So, uh, can we have the first question? If you don't mind, if you can introduce yourself, and I'm going to take two or three questions uh, and try to wrap up in about ten minutes or so, please. Okay. My name is Tan King So. I hear you. You. My name is Tan King Soon. I'm from Tan Ing Kiam Foundation. I have two questions. Earlier, Mr. Bilahari mentioned that he's beginning to see domestic politics starting to intrude on our foreign policies. What issues uh, does he have in mind? What are the potential dangers can he foresee? That's my first question. The second question is regarding uh, uh, Singapore's relations with China and the US. Singapore is friends with both China and US. In the event of a conflict between the two powers, what would Singapore's position be? Thank you. That was a very difficult question, by the way. <laughs> but I'm sure Bilahari thinks she can answer it. <laughs> so, Yvonne, yes, please go ahead. Good, after uh, good afternoon, Dean and Your Excellencies. Uh, my name is Yvonne. I'm a PhD student at the Lee Kuan Yew School, currently writing my thesis on Singapore and Switzerland. I feel that Switzerland provides an interesting counterpoint to Singapore's experience. In particular, Switzerland has a relatively successful foreign policy, despite significant domestic influence in the determination of its foreign policy and its adherence to the principle of neutrality. In contrast, Singapore's foreign policy is pragmatic and non-ideological and driven by the state rather than domestic forces. How do you explain the success of both states' foreign policies despite these divergent strategies? Thank you very much. Okay, A any more questions? First, I'll take one or two more, then I'll give uh, uh, both Bilahari, yes, please. Yes. Can you come, Manu, I think. Just come to the microphone. Hi, uh, this is Manu. Manu yeah. Um, listening to Ambassador Chan and Bilahari, I mean, you know, we've, as a little red dot, we've established obviously a very large footprint in, in the international arena. My, my question is, um, how, how are we going to fill these large shoes, you know? It doesn't appear that we have anyone uh, having that amount of influence for the future. And uh, the other question is really, um, um, what, is, what is the biggest uh, geopolitical threat? I mean, we, we had in the 60s Indonesia and Sukarno, and we've had other threats, but uh, what threat do you see as being the, uh, difficult to resolve and which could you know, give us difficulties in the future? Okay, excellent questions. Okay, now one last question. I have one question from a student, but uh, go ahead, please. I think that's uh, Astrid, yes, please. Come to the microphone. question is to Ambassador Chan. I very much like the way you phrase the foundation of early Singaporean foreign policy as based on the vulnerabilities of a small state. Today, the foreign policy must be based on the strengths of a world-class, global, prosperous city-state, a city set on a hill. So I was wondering what might be, what has to become fundamentally different given that the foundations have shifted for Singapore's foreign policy. Thank you. Okay, now let me for the last question. Oh, is there any more questions? No. One more? Yes, please. Go ahead. Yes. The last question, yes. 
Prabhu Chandaria. I want to propose to Ambassador Chan the issue of Singapore's contribution to see that the smaller nations have the benefit of what Mr. Lee Kuan Yew has been able to do for Singapore because for future I think the contribution for the school and for Singapore is how to see the smaller nations gain the experience from the experience of Singapore. Okay, thank you. Okay, the last question, this is uh, from a student in our Chinese MPAM program, his name is Zheng Hua. And his question is, what is Mr. Lee's view on the most significant implication of Singapore's geographical position on the country's development over the next 10 to 20 years, especially given new competition coming from Myanmar and Thailand establishing economic zones and so on and so forth? What is the new economic competition for Singapore? So those, mar those are the questions. So maybe Bilahari, do you want to start first? And then okay, I'll, if, I'll if both of you can uh, take about five minutes each, that would, would be great. Okay. Well, somebody asked, I forgot who, uh, what are the politicizations I see? Well, if you look at the last few parliamentary sessions, there were some questions about the haze, there were some questions about the Middle East that, to my mind, very clearly had a political agenda. Um, now, the danger of the politicization of foreign policy is simply that it slows things down. Um, I think as Hing Chi made it very clear, Mr. Lee's view, and it is a fact because we are a small country, that in international relations we are by and large a price taker, not a price setter. We have to look at the world, we have to be nimble in order to take advantage of opportunities or get out of harm's way. And if, if we ha do not have a basic con consensus on fundamentals, which I don't see because there's a different generation now, if we cannot resist the temptation to use foreign policy as a partisan political tool, you will lose that nimbleness. We have great dangers. There was another question about how we will, how we will position ourselves in the event of the US-China conflict. The simple answer is very, very carefully. <laughs> But I think fortunately, it will not come to that. I think the US and China have a terribly complicated relationship. It is not a very comfortable relationship to each side. There's a great deal of strategic distrust, but it is at the end of the day, a pragmatic relationship. Neither of these countries knows that it can today achieve its national goals without working with the other. I don't think, they, I'm not saying they like it, but they understand it. So I think, and this comes back to the first point. As long as we are nimble, as long as we are able to analyze situations in an unsentimental way, I think we'll be all right. Although we'll have to be very careful. Now, the mention of unsentimentality brings me to the second qu question, question by the second person who I believe is a PhD candidate. It's only a question that can be asked by a PhD student. Uh, and it brings me to the point about sentimentality. We have modeled ourselves on Switzerland, on Switzerland as a metaphor, but in foreign policy, the Swiss example is totally and utterly irrelevant for one very simple reason. Switzerland is located in Europe, and we are located in a far less salubrious region. Mano asked how, how we would do without Lee Kuan Yew. Well, I tried to answer that in my prepared remarks. Well, there's only one Lee Kuan Yew, that's the fact. There's only one Mano. You know, some may think that's a good thing, some may not think that's a good thing, but there's only one. There's only one of, of you know, a Kishore too. Uh, but, you know, I think as long as I said in my remarks, as long as we do not lose sight of what characterized Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's approach towards thinking about foreign policy, uh, we will be all right. Mr. Go Chok Tong was quite respected in his own way. So as Mr. Lee Sen-Lung. <laughs> uh, and we have a far more institutionalized foreign policy system these days. So I am not totally pessimistic, except with the caveats I uh, mentioned at the end of my mention. What are the great geopolitical challenges that we will face? Well, I think there are three. No, there are three. First of all, the world is in a more than usual state of flux. The U.S. is still at the top of the international hierarchy, but it is clear that the U.S. needs help to get things done. Um, and it is not self-evident that the other rising powers either have the capability or 
see a strategic imperative in helping. So you're going to have a more than usually unpredictable world in which you know, there are going to be suboptimal solutions to many problems, whether in the Middle East or you know, climate change or proliferation and so on. The second uh, issue is I see our own region, Southeast Asia, in a state of flux. There are many political transitions underway in many of our neighbours, and these are not the routine transitions of, you know, through elections, changing governments or changing leaders. There are systemic changes underway in Thailand, for example, in Myanmar, which is not irreversible, in my view at least, in Malaysia, and the, the systemic transformation that began in Indonesia with the fall of President Suharto is not yet complete. And these are just some examples. It leads to more uncertainty, not merely at the global or strategic level, but at the regional level. And finally, US-China relations, although I said I am not pessimistic about it, are immensely complicated. It's something that we have to be constantly alert and aware about. Thank you. Oh, sorry, there's something. New competition? New competition, the, the, is the new competition, the old competition. New competition, not from Myanmar or Thailand, it's from the world. When I think Heng Chi will bear this out, now those of you in the economy will feel to bear you out, when you're looking for new in investments, you are competing not against uh, Thailand or Myanmar, or th you are competing against various states of the United States. We're talking about various components of the EU. You're competing with the world. But that is the normal state of affairs for a country like Singapore. Get used to it. Is there anything left for me to say? <laughs> No, 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 no. Remember, 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 I began by saying each is more brilliant than the other. No. Well, first, let me just touch on the US-China um, question first, because Bilahari has given a very full answer, but I'll just add that, yes, the relationship is, in fact, complicated, but the two countries are getting a little more sophisticated in dealing with each other. For instance, what you hear along the corridors in Washington is that the countries have learned to put issues in different baskets. And what is a problem in one basket, they were not allowed to cross over to taint another basket. For instance, you know, uh, human rights will not just you know, flow over and affect, let's say, trade or the strategic cooperation on North Korea. So you know, issues are in different baskets. Nonetheless, I think that critical question is there a new model of relations between the established power and the rising power? That is something the two uh, countries, two powers, must seek to establish. Uh, Hillary Clinton, in her farewell visit to Beijing, said that we must look for this new way of interacting. And Sunny Lands was supposed to be the Sunny Lands meeting between Xi Jinping and Barack Obama this year, President Obama, was supposed to be some search for that. But let's see if it works out. Um, I, I think for the, these um, few years, it's OK. The test would be when China's economy really becomes bigger than the United States. And it's the number one economy in the world. But it may not be the richest country in the world. <clears throat> but I think then you may get a different reaction from the United States because the nervousness would be there. So I would uh, uh, sort of uh, just add that on to that answer. On the question on vulnerabilities of a small state, now we are an established world city-state. I would say the vulnerabilities for Singapore are still there and always there. If Singaporeans should for a moment believe that, you know, we are home free and we're fine and, you know, our depth of wealth is very, um, you know, goes layers down, we are mistaken. We are a very vulnerable um, country in a vulnerable spot. That is the condition of being Singapore. You know, those of you who have read Alice in Wonderland, the Red Queen said she must run twice as fast to keep on the same spot. I think we should get everyone to read Alice in Wonderland. You know, I think that's exactly Singapore. And you, we just have to keep going. You know, and this is what we have to explain to younger Singaporeans because I don't think they get this. They see a wealthy Singapore, an affluent Singapore, and so you get um, uh, sort of the wish 
people wanting a different set of values, a more relaxed Singapore, a different Singapore. And if you ask me, I'll link that to new competition. How are we going to deal with that? Well, we must avoid that kind of feeling that we should get more relaxed because competition is there. As Bilahari said, we have been dealing with the competition. If it's not China or India, you know, we are now dealing, what about Vietnam? Wait till Vietnam starts running. This is a country that defeated two great powers, you know, the French and the Americans. And, uh, you know, people talk of Indonesia now, it's slow. But, you know, and there's Myanmar to come. Different countries will have, offer different attractions. So we really have to keep on our toes. Today, we are competing with states in the United States, we are competing with Australia, we are competing with Ireland when we go out to um, try to attract investments. So uh, there's a lot to worry about there. Uh, on um, the um, biggest geopolitical threat facing us, I agree it is really what's happening in the region, the rise of the um, China and to see where the US-China relationship leads because if something should go wrong and sometimes it goes not, not wrong not because it was intended to go that way but a certain accident and driven by uh, domestic opinion could lead things in a direction we do not want. So we worry about that and I think what's happening in the region and the rising nationalism in so many um, countries that are emerging is worrisome because nationalism is contagious and when one country feels that particularly over sovereign claims it can go round and uh, we should worry a bit about that um, on uh, the lessons for other small states lessons for other small states does Singapore offer lessons for other small states the World Bank thinks so and I will tell you that uh, Lee Kuan Yew's uh, two volumes, the memoirs, Third World to First especially, has been taken up quite, quite a few copies by the World Bank. And I'm told that they give it to you know, new countries to read as a primer for those who want to build a nation. The first few chapters is a blueprint on building a nation. And so World Bank uses this. Um, can we, in fact, teach others to learn from Singapore's lessons. You know, Singapore works because we are a system. Everything comes together. We can teach, but if you are just plucking lesson one and lesson seven and lesson eight and lesson 12, it will not, you cannot create a Singapore out of those few lessons. It's the system, but more than the system, it is the people that make it work. Maybe we are just a lucky country in that sense. We are a lucky country because we had good leaders, we had the people, and we found the right system. But we shouldn't just count on luck. We better learn our lessons and make sure we can continue to produce and keep the system, produce good leaders, and that people will go along and buy into this set of ideas that have been laid down. We can try alternative ideas. I'm sure we can tweak things differently. Mr. Hings, we can. Minister Hings said, you know, this is a different time, and so you have to try new things. We should, but we must remember that there's always a call, and um, it's whether we keep to the core values that made our system. Now, how do you teach this to other countries? Uh, lastly, I'd like to do a plug for MFA. We do have a technical cooperation program and um, we offer a menu of courses of what do you want to learn from Singapore? How to run a port, how to do tourism, you know, how to run at the airport, um, how to do your banks, etc. Teaching, nursing, etc. It's a very good program and I'll let my former permanent secretary uh, tell you a bit more about that. Well, we do invest very heavily in technical assistance for other countries. It's called the Singapore Cooperation Program. It's a program of technical assistance and training, not of cash grants. 
but the cash value of it is not uh, insignificant. I uh, think it's somewhere in the region of 30 to 40 million dollars a year, uh, not including what we do for ASEAN, which is, um, for example, over the last, since 2012-2015, we've pledged 50 million dollars over that time for what is called the Initiative for ASEAN Integration, uh, which is meant to, to bring up the, the less developed ASEAN countries. But the point about the Singapore Technical Assistance Program is this. Many countries want to learn our lessons, whatever, and we are welcome, we welcome them, we, uh, we, uh, we think, but we always tell them one thing. This is how we do it. You go home and you adapt it to your conditions because we do not know. You know your country best. We are not here to impose our views on anybody. We can only tell you this is how we have done it. You know your country best, you adapt it to your own conditions. Well, I think, you know, we have uh, gone over time, but you agree that since Mr. Lee Kuan Yew is universally acknowledged to be one of the geopolitical, I guess, grand chess masters of the world in that field, you've had some remarkably good insights into that area, which I think we have, we have a lot to reflect on. With that, you're going to have a much shorter coffee break, as, Jill, as Jillian will announce very shortly, and then hope to get you back on time at 3.45, and then get you out as close as you can to the 5 o'clock or so. Well, thank you very much. Please join me in thanking Bilahari and Enchi. I don't want to be remembered as a statesman, but someone who is determined, consistent and persistent. And someone who has been a pilot to the US, especially in their relations with Southeast Asia. We, uh, please join me again in thanking Ms. Ambassadors at Large, Mr. Bilahari Kasukan and <coughs> Professor Chan Heng Chi, uh, for this wonderful session, this wonderful tour of Mr. Lee Kuan thoughts on geopolitics.